On October 20th, 1977, the world lost a remarkable talent when Ronnie Van Zant passed away at the pinnacle of his career. His untimely death marked the conclusion of an extraordinary chapter in the annals of rock and roll. A founding member of Leonard Skinner, Van Zandt hailed from Jacksonville, Florida. In his younger years, Ronnie dreamed of becoming a star baseball player, dominating the field with his team. However, fate had other plans. One day, he joined a group of local boys who shared his passion for both baseball and music. As they gathered in the gym, they began playing music together and soon realized that their true calling was to form a band rather than pursue sports careers. Through this band, Ronnie discovered a powerful way to express and communicate his emotions via the music they created. Ronnie Van Zant possessed a remarkable talent for crafting words and melodies that is difficult to describe. His unique singing voice and ability to weave lyrics around iconic guitar riffs led to the creation of timeless songs. To better understand Van Zant, it's helpful to reflect on his influences. Welcome to Bold Bios. On this channel, we tell the stories of history's most important and sometimes not so important people. If you enjoy this type of content, you should hit the subscribe button and tap the notification bell so you get notified every time we upload a video. With that being said, let's examine the story of Ronnie Van Zant. Mama told me when I was young, come sit beside me, my only son. As a young man, Ronnie admired various public figures such as Muhammad Ali, the legendary boxer who claimed to be the greatest of all time. And perhaps he was right. In his early years, Ronnie even dabbed in boxing himself. Another hero of his was Mickey Mantle, the renowned New York Yankees outfielder. Ronnie's love for baseball was shared by fellow Leonard Skinner founding members, drummer Bob Burns and guitarist Gary Rosington. Ronnie also looked up to musicians like Jimmy Page, the guitarist from Led Zeppelin and Paul McCartney, the bassist of the Beatles. Additionally, he held a deep appreciation for the artistry of choreographer and dancer Alvin Ailey. It's worth pondering whether Ronnie was joking or genuinely admiring Alvin Ailey when he mentioned him as an influence. He even claimed, I would have definitely been a dancer if it weren't for rock and roll. If you're unfamiliar with Alvin Ailey, it's worth researching his work and background. Some speculate that his reference may have been a subtle jab at Neil Young in their ongoing discourse about the South. As a master wordsmith, Ronnie left it open for interpretation. Apart from music, fishing was another passion for Ronnie, providing him with a sense of tranquility. Bandmate Ed King recounted the early days at their Hell House practice facility when Ronnie would occasionally grab a fishing pole and head to the water behind the house. As he fished, he listened to the music echoing from the building, allowing himself to relax. Later, he would return with fresh lyrics and innovative song arrangements, further solidifying his reputation as a creative genius. Fishing served as a way for Ronnie to rejuvenate and unwind. Another remarkable trait he possessed was his exceptional memory. Most of the songs he composed were never pinned down. He stored the lyrics and tunes in his mind. One anecdote from his early years highlights his impressive memory while working at an auto parts store. He quickly memorized the entire inventory, rarely needing to look up a part. The initial band lineup included Ronnie, guitarist Gary Rosington, drummer Bob Burns, guitarist Alan Collins, and bassist Larry Junstrom. Though the lineup would evolve over time, these five individuals were the founding members of what would become Leonard Skinner. As the band's frontman and singer, Ronnie naturally emerged as the leader. His charisma and exceptional music instincts allowed him to contribute significantly to the band's compositions, playing guitar and piano and knowing precisely how a song should sound. As for whether Ronnie was a great singer, opinions may vary. However, in my view, he was an outstanding vocalist. His singing style evoked a blend of Merle Haggard and Bob Seger, making his voice distinctive and memorable. During live performances, pay attention to his pitch control. His seldom misses a note. Keep in mind that in the 1970s, the monitoring systems were far from today's standards. Personally, I believe Van Zant was a phenomenal singer. He possessed both charisma and strength, capable of delivering songs that resonated deeply with audiences. As a songwriter, he ranks among the best. His talents for crafting words and integrating them into music created an emotional connection for listeners. If Ronnie had lived longer, he would have undoubtedly left a legacy of incredible songs and had been considered one of the all-time greats. There has been speculation about a supposed feud between Ronnie and Neil Young. Was it genuine? Here's what Ronnie once stated. Neil Young composed Southern Man About Alabama, critiquing the South. In response, we created Sweet Home Alabama. Unbeknownst to many, Neil Young is a Canadian, and I had an encounter with his wife. I was unaware of her marital status when we met at Woodstock in 1969 and shared a moment in the woods. 
She left him a few months later and he wrote Southern Man. I can't fault him. It's an excellent song. He's indebted to me. This statement is a classic example of musicians teasing one another. Certainly, Ronnie was exaggerating a bit in his statement, but in reality, he wasn't a fan of the narrative the two songs conveyed. He responded with his own creation, Sweet Home Alabama. As for his feelings toward Neil Young, it's inaccurate to say he disliked him. Reports from those present indicate that he admired and respected Young. In fact, I found a quote from Neil Young at Rock Music Revival where he says, I think Sweet Home Alabama is a great song. I've actually performed it live a couple times myself. My own song richly deserved the shot Leonard Skinner gave me with their great record. I don't like my words when I listen to it today. This information suggests that there was no real feud. Sweet Home Alabama was basically, uh, Ronnie explained it to me, he's telling the, the Southern man and, and uh, that, that the Southern man is not to be blamed for something that happened 400 years ago, or 300 or 200 years ago. Um, he's saying, Neil Young, you know, I don't have anything against African American people. And Ronnie didn't. Ronnie would give the shirt off his back to anybody, black or white. Ronnie was not a racist. You know, and it's like, uh, Ronnie's vocals and his stuff was from the heart, his words were from the heart. And that's what has lasted 20 years. Not guitar players or drummers, you know, not, you know, but Ronnie Van Zant's heart and soul. And that's the writing. That's what I love about. And Ronnie, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of singers will jump around stage and they'll shake their body to the beat of every, every beat of every tune. And they'll, you know, they look like basically clowns. Ronnie would stand there and he would, he would sing, you know, he didn't need anything else. He had, he had who he was and from his heart on that microphone. When Ronnie was interviewed, he may have had a few drinks and decided to stir up some media attention. Regarding alcohol, it's true that Ronnie could be difficult when intoxicated, particularly with hard liquor. Many people would have been better off avoiding such substances, and Ronnie was no exception. I won't delve into the numerous drinking, fighting, and arrest stories here, as the media has already covered them extensively. However, I'd like to briefly discuss Ronnie's behavior when he wasn't drinking. His wife Judy claims that he was a completely different person at home compared to his life on the road, and this is supported by his bandmates' accounts. Once they began drinking, using drugs, and maintaining the reputation of rowdy Southern musicians, their personalities shifted. Guitarist Ed King mentioned that this lifestyle was the reason he ultimately left the band. He and Ronnie had had a conflict after Ronnie had been drinking, and Ed had had enough of life on the road living like that. Despite these issues, it's been said that you couldn't find a better friend or person than Ronnie Van Zant when he wasn't drinking. Drummer Artemis Powell shared his thoughts. Ronnie was the most caring, loving guy you could ever meet. He'd give you the shirt off his back, but he could be as mean as a snake when he started drinking. I'm sure they were all like that in a way, not just Ronnie. But one thing about him was he was a leader and very headstrong, which only intensified when drinking. I've known lots of people like that in my life and Ronnie was no different than they were. He just received a lot more publicity, that's all. One of the band's most well-crafted songs was Simple Man. Skinner had achieved great success with this track and it might not have been recorded without Ronnie's leadership and straightforward approach. Al Cooper from the band Blood, Sweat and Tears discovered Leonard Skinner during one of their shows. He signed them to his label, Sounds of the South, which was supported by MCA Records. During one of the recording sessions for Leonard's first album, producer Al Cooper didn't like the song Simple Man and thought it was weak. He told the band it was a waste of studio time and asked them to drop it. As the story goes, Ronnie confronted Cooper and told him he could wait outside while they recorded the song. Ronnie re-entered the room and the engineer started recording. Although Cooper claims to have produced the song, it seems he stayed outside as Ronnie instructed, leaving the band to produce it themselves. Sadly, Ronnie Van Zant, the lead singer of the Southern rock and roll band Leonard Skinner, died on October 20, 1977 in a plane crash in Gillsburg, Mississippi. The band's chartered plane, a Convair CB240, ran out of fuel and crashed into a forest. Van Zant, along with guitarist Steve Gaines, backup singer Cassie Gaines, assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick, and the two pilots all lost their lives in the tragic accident. The cause of the crash was determined to be pilot error, as the crew failed to properly monitor the fuel levels and make a necessary stop to refuel. Thursday, October 20th, a twin-engine Convair 240 with the name Leonard Skinner painted on the side is 580 miles out of Greenville, South Carolina, bound for Baton Rouge. The 24 passengers aboard are heading for a concert date Friday night. They're relaxing. Some are playing poker. Most musicians 
at a certain point will sit down and they'll say, you know, is our time coming? I mean, when you fly two and three hundred airplanes a year, you always feel that there's a point when it may catch up with you. It is shortly before six o'clock central daylight time. The pilot, Walter McCreary of Dallas, Texas, radios Houston air traffic control. He's low on fuel and can't make Baton Rouge 80 miles away. Instead, he'll try for a small airport at nearby Macomb, Mississippi. We found out 10 minutes from the Baton Rouge airport that we ran out of gas, and uh, I just heard the pilot go, oh my god. Pilot McCreary turns his plane to the left and starts back toward Macomb. His altimeter reads 2,000 feet. The time is just past 6 o'clock. One of the engines on the conveyor quits, probably starved for fuel. My wife and I were out sitting in our backyard, and we heard this plane come over. With, it sounded like it was running on one engine. And uh, then all of a sudden, I heard that engine go out. By now, Pilot McCreary is desperately looking for a spot for an emergency landing. He follows a pipeline route. For reasons unknown, McCreary changes his mind and heads for a better spot, a pasture off to his left. The Convair 240 is in a glide, 100 yards short of the pasture. The wings are clipping treetops. The plane stalls and goes down. The Leonard Skinner band was riding high. They had just released a new album, Street Survivors, and set out on a five-month cross-country tour to promote it. They were on their way to a concert at Louisiana State University when disaster happened. We got to spiral down, trying to lose altitude, trying to face the land. And I thought he was going to make this field, and at the last minute I saw that it wasn't. Started clipping pine trees. And at that point, I grabbed a blanket and braced myself, and put the blanket over my face. All I saw was treetops. I looked out my window. I was in the middle of the airplane on the right wing. I tried to get close to the back of the airplane as possible. But I got in the middle of the airplane on the right wing, and um, all I saw was treetops. And at, at first it wasn't so bad, but then when it hit the, you know, the middle of the trees, it was horrible. You know, it, was, it was an experience nobody wants to ever experience, never. Pianist Billy Powell, drummer Artemis Pyle, and another passenger managed to climb through a window and go for help. Neighbors who'd heard the crash were among the first rescue workers to arrive. We walked through the woods to the site. And at that time, there was nobody on the site. Well, we started getting them out then, getting the ones that were hurt out, and everybody's out too. Under the glare of helicopter floodlights, the 23 victims were pulled one by one from the wreckage, placed on stretchers, and carried 100 yards through dense woods and across a creek to waiting ambulances. They were rushed to Southwest Mississippi Medical Center in Macomb. It took more than an hour to get all the victims to the hospital. Six are dead. Eleven are admitted for treatment after receiving emergency care. Eight are flown to two other hospitals in Jackson, Mississippi. One, Drummer Pyle, was treated and released. By all accounts, the hospital staff handled the disaster well. The head doctor credited countless rehearsals, which he said prepared his people for the real thing. Before dawn the next morning, the hospital had compiled a list of 26 names and notified next of kin. The dead, the pilot and co-pilot. Band leader, Ronnie Van Zant. Guitarist, Steve Gaines. His sister, singer Cassie Gaines. And assistant road manager, Dean Kilpatrick of Jacksonville. The 20 survivors included singer Leslie Hawkins, bass guitarist, Leon Wilkeson, guitarist, Alan Collins, and guitarist Gary Rossington. Wilkerson and Rossington suffered the most severe injuries. He has two broken arms, a broken leg, a broken pelvis, a punctured stomach, and a punctured liver. And he's going to be in the hospital in Jackson, Mississippi, for about another month. But uh, Leon, Leon's got tremendous amounts of internal injuries, and Alan's got a, a broken, not a broken neck, but a cracked neck. Every airplane crash is methodically investigated by specialists from the National Transportation Safety Board. They look at wreckage as pieces of a puzzle which, when put together, will tell them why a plane crashed. The search at the scene even extends to the passenger's luggage. The board looks into about 4,500 mishaps a year. 
To the field investigators, wreckage is routine business. But for the rest of us who saw the remains of Leonard Skinner's Convair 240, the sight is unforgettable. You can't even realize, seeing one of these things on television, exactly what a crash of this magnitude looks like. Up there, sitting against the tree, is a piece of an airplane wing torn away from the rest of the airplane. Lying down there at the base of the tree is the engine. And that back there, that twisted metal back there, is the fuselage of the plane, which sort of was turned around a corner. It was just terrible. People are hollering, screaming, and I've never witnessed anything before in my lifetime. It was just a disaster to me. I've never seen anything like it. And uh, it just hit me hard. Nine days have passed since the crash, and the investigation has really only just begun. Authorities still believe the plane ran out of gas. But why? Didn't they put enough gas in the tanks, or was there a leak? We won't know the answers to those questions for at least a month. Gary Rossington and Leon Wilkerson are still hospitalized in the intensive care unit. They could stay there anywhere from two more weeks to a month. Leslie Hawkins has had extensive plastic surgery on her face. Alan Collins is moving around despite a huge plaster cast for his cracked neck. Artemis Pyle is not in the hospital, but friends say he is still not recovered from the shock. What about Leonard Skinner? Will, they, will, there, will there be a Leonard Skinner after this? I don't think so. Van Zandt's death was a great loss to the music world, as he was known for his powerful vocals and songwriting talent. The ability to write songs for Ronnie. I'll write songs down a lot, and then I'll wad them up and throw them away because I'm afraid for people to know how I feel. Ronnie, right or wrong, he put his feelings on his sleeve. He wore his heart on his sleeve. That's what I really dig about Ronnie's writing. I miss Ronnie, man, I really do. In 1978, the Charlie Daniels Band released the song Reflections on their album, Million Mile Reflections. The third verse references Van Zant and simply says, and Ronnie, my buddy, above all the rest, I wish you the most and love you the best. The record sleeve also features a dedication in a poem with the final line, fly on proud bird, you're free at last, signed by Charlie Daniels. In interviews, Gary Rosington has stated that the current Leonard Skinner lineup is a tribute band, aiming to keep the band and Ronnie's songs alive, believing that's what Ronnie would have wanted. Hearing this from the last two surviving members, it's hard not to consider Ronnie the heart and leader of the band. Although some may disagree, I believe that when Ronnie Van Zant passed away, Leonard Skinner, as it was known, died too. The bands that formed after Ronnie's passing were undoubtedly talented, but without him writing new songs, they essentially became cover bands performing the songs created during Ronnie's lifetime. Although some of these bands have released albums with original tracks, they don't quite measure up to Ronnie Van Zant's songwriting. He was undoubtedly one of the greatest songwriters in rock and roll history, and had he lived a full life, he would have only improved and expanded his catalog. Anyways, that's it for the video today, guys. If you enjoyed the content here on Bold Bios, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and tap the notification bell so you can get notified every time we upload a video. Until the next time.